Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with the first lecture for the Female Reproductive System in Anatomy and Physiology 2. This introductory slide that you're looking at shows the symbol for females on the left. And the picture that you're looking at is of the fallopian tubes. And you can see that some of the cells have cilia, and they're shown as yellow here. And we'll look at that a little bit more in detail later, but the cilia move the fluid that's present in the peritoneal cavity, and that helps propel the oocyte, or the ovum, into the fallopian tubes. I like that picture. So let's start off by looking at the organs that are part of the reproductive system in females. The primary organ, just like in males, is the gonad, and there's two of them. So bilateral, we have ovaries in the um, abdominal pelvic cavity, um, right and left. And these ovaries produce gametes, just like in males, but the gametes in females are called ova, or you could call them oocytes. And you really do say it that way. It really is oocytes. The other thing that ovaries do in the female is control the cycle, the monthly cycle in the uterus. And that's because the ovaries secrete hormones that travel in the blood to the uterus and control the lining of the uterus. So the ovaries are the primary organs. In addition, there are accessory organs, or you could call them secondary organs. These accessory organs consist of structures that we can see outside of the body, or the body wall. That includes the external genitalia, the labia, which are around the urethral and um, vaginal openings. And then there's a um, section that's a little bit anterior to that that has erectile tissue along the body wall, and that's called the um, clitoris. Then the other accessory reproductive organs are actually internal, not external. And they include the vagina and the uterus, and the uterus has horns, tubes, or you can call them fallopian tubes, that um, look like they're attached to this white ovary here, but they're really not. Um, they're just close in proximity. So let's look at the functions, the structure, and the functions of the external genitalia first. So by definition, external genitalia are external to the vagina or the body wall. Sometimes we call the external genitalia the vulva. And it consists of um, the mons pubis, which is um, kind of a raised portion that's anterior to the urethral opening. So we see the urethral opening is right here. And po posterior or dorsal to that is the vaginal opening. Surrounding those two openings or orifices, we have um, the labia. There are some, they're folds of skin-like tissue. Um, the labia majora are the two folds of tissue that are most external. And then internal are the labia minora. And they're a little bit smaller, and they're closer to the openings here. As I mentioned before, the erectile tissue is anterior, just underneath the skin, and a little bit um, headed towards the mons pubis, and that's the clitoris. Um, and so I just want to want you to note that the opening to the vagina here is um, in between the opening to the urethra as and the opening to the the rectum, also known as the anus.
So what are the functions of these external genitalia organs? Primarily lubrication um, to receive the male penis into the vagina. So there are glands in those labia, labia majora and labia minora, and they secrete um, kind of a um, kind of a um, a fatty liquid that or oily liquid um, that helps prevent um, uh, friction. That's what it does. Couldn't think of the word friction. There aren't any glands in the wall of the vagina, so it's important that um, there's something at least superficial so that when the penis penetrates the vagina, it kind of takes with it that lubrication. Also present in the female external genitalia is uh, erectile tissue that has sensory nerve endings. And I've already mentioned the clitoris, which is anterior, but there's also some erectile tissue that's very sensitive in the labia majora. These are called vestibular bulbs. So let's look at um, the anatomy of the internal reproductive organs now that are considered accessory organs. So we have the vagina, which I've mentioned here. And then we have the uterus. And notice that the opening to the uterus is um, called the cervix, or at least the tip of the uterus that extends kind of into the vagina is called the cervix. The uterine horns are often called uterine tubes or fallopian tubes, and they end in this finger-like um, or hand-like structure with fingers called fimbriae. So those fimbriae are going to move to help propel an oocyte that's released from the ovary into the fallopian tube. Okay, so let's look at the functions of the vagina now that we know the anatomy a little bit. The function of the vagina primarily is to receive the penis during sexual intercourse, but of course, if pregnancy occurs and there's delivery of an infant, it also provides a passageway for the infant. So you can imagine there's going to have to be some stretch involved um, when um, a baby is born and exits the uterus. In addition, the vagina allows menstrual flow to come from the uterus to the outside of the body. So the menstrual flow that happens monthly um, is really a shedding of the lining of the uterus. And that, that lining is highly vascular, so we see a lot of blood released from that lining and it flows through the vagina. Now, um, prior to intercourse or um, some kind of other um, activity that breaks this membrane, there is a membrane that lies over the opening of the vagina and it's called the hymen. It's not a complete membrane there are some perforations in it or holes in it that allow menstrual flow monthly. Um, but usually once intercourse has happened, uh, you know, the hymen is broken and um, eventually is resorbed and some of it is shed with the menstrual flow. Now there's a lot of variations amongst women um, in terms of the structure of the hymen. So you'll notice a common uh, variation would be A, um, D, and E, those variations. So sometimes the incomplete membrane has a rather large hole 
sometimes lots of little holes and sometimes kind of bifurcated like this but there's all sorts of variations for the hymen um, and sometimes physical activity leads to not exactly injuries but some kind of physical trauma that's not too severe that breaks the hymen before sexual intercourse so it would end up looking more like this but all of these are normal situations okay now we're going to look at the tissue um, or histology of the vagina and there's layers of tissue just like we saw in the digestive tract um, the mucosa is the innermost lining so the lumen of the vagina is up at the top of this slide and the mucosa is made up of stratified squamous epithelium and that's important because if you remember stratified epithelium um, is located in areas where there's a lot of friction so you can lose some cells and there's still protection epithelial protection and of course there's going to be a layer um, the, of cells that can undergo mitosis to replace any um, cells that are sloughed off during the um, course intercourse or menstruation for that matter the cells of the epithelium contain glycogen and this glycogen is shed into the lumen of the vagina so glycogen is a carbohydrate and bacteria metabolize that into lactic acid so we see that the lumen of the vagina has a pH that's quite acidic 3.5 to 4 and that's due to the presence of lactic acid then the deeper layer is called the musc whoops I went too far the muscularis which starts about here I forgot to mention that underneath the epithelium there's always connective tissue and so this connective tissue layer is called the lamina propria it's part of the mucosa the muscularis of course contains smooth muscle and that smooth muscle runs in several layers and several directions circular as well as longitudinal and then the outermost type of tissue is um, a connective tissue as well fibrous and kind of loose connective tissue which has elastic fibers it's called the adventitia and it's present on the outside that picture is pretty magnified but I kind of like this picture better for the histology of the vagina notice that the epithelium has these folds that we saw in the stomach similar but in this situation the folds don't form pits there's no pits in the vagina but still those roughened ridges are called rugae just like in the stomach and the rugae are formed by the mucosa layer and so here we see the stratified epithelium and the um, lamina propria underneath and then the muscularis layer which is right here okay now let's look at the uterus so the vagina and the uterus are kind of continuous at least they're outside but on the inside um, we see that the uterus has this kind of cupped ending which is referred to as the cervix and what the cervix as well as the body of the uterus does is provide a pathway for sperm to reach the oocyte now this is the ovary here and that's where the oocyte or ova are made and um, the ova will actually enter the fallopian tube or I guess you could call it the uterine tube and travel eventually if they're fertilized into the uterus and it's in the uterus that a fertilized egg will implant for development of the embryo the other thing that the uterus does besides um, 
provide a passageway for the oocyte and the sperm to meet because the sperm are going to move through the cervix and the uterine body and come out here to meet the oocyte in the fallopian tube where fertilization takes place. But the other thing that the um, uterus needs to do is form what's known as the placenta, which is a nourishing set of membranes and blood vessels that help maintain the embryo and the fetus um, during gestation or pregnancy. And then finally, what has to happen is that the infant, when it's grown to a certain size, needs to be pushed out of the uterus. And so we're going to see that the uterus has some muscle to do that. It's all smooth muscle. And it also needs to expel the placenta. You don't want the placenta to stay there and become kind of necrotic or dead. So let's look at the gross anatomy of the uterus one more time here. We see the cervix is kind of cupped shape with the opening, the uterine opening. And then the body is where the, the large space is located, somewhat large, um, where implantation will take place. The top of the uterus is referred to as the fundus. And the uterine tube, which I've mentioned before, um, projects to the right and to the left. So we have two uterine tubes. And the uterine tube, as it projects, widens into a region called the infundibulum. And the infundibulum has these finger-like projections called the fimbriae. So the innermost lining of the body of the uterus is called endometrium. And so we're going to look at the tissue in a little bit, but the endometrium lines the uterus. And then the next superficial layer is referred to as the myometrium. And that's where muscle is located, the smooth muscle. So this is a picture of um, a cross-section of a uterus. <clears throat> and you notice that Actually, the lumen is a potential space, meaning that it can widen um, for pregnancy. And usually, though, you know, the uterine wall is pretty thick. And so the lumen space is a little bit collapsed like this. So the outermost layer of the uterine wall is called the parametrium. And it's a connective tissue sheath. It's very thin. Well, relatively thin. It's called the parametrium. And then the two layers that I showed you before include the myometrium, where the smooth muscle is, and then the endometrium. And in this particular picture, we see that the endometrium is quite thick. There's two layers labeled 3A and 3B. One layer is called the stratum basalis, and the other layer is called the stratum functionalis. That's the layer that's most interior. So what the endometrium does is form the placenta, provide a nourishing um, site with lots of blood vessels and epithelial cells and nutrients for implantation and development of the embryo and the fetus. As development proceeds, we tend to call the embryo a fetus. The myometrium containing smooth muscle is what will help expel, expel the fetus and the placenta during labor when a baby is born. So the function of the cervix I haven't talked about much other than, you know, it, it's kind of this cone-shaped region and there's a canal that sperm can travel through. And of course, um, menses can flow out of the uterus through the cervical canal as well as a, a baby when it's born. But what the cervix does is secrete mucus that blocks bacteria that might come in via the vag vagina. So if bacteria get into the vagina, there's mucus present here at um, 
the opening of the uterus called the cervix and so they're blocked from dividing and moving into the uterus that mucus also blocks sperm um, from entering the uterus but the sperm as we've talked about have secretions that help thin that mucus so they can get through it turns out though that the cervix makes less mucus during um, kind of the middle of a woman's monthly cycle so that helps the sperm actually get through at the appropriate time to meet up with an ovum the vagina also dilates during I'm sorry not the vagina the cervix also dilates during birth so you've probably heard about or seen on movies or something the fact that a woman goes through different stages of labor contractions are a certain time period apart and also the opening to the uterus is kind of measured so that's the cervix that they're looking at and they're looking to see how dilated it is to be able to predict um, when the baby might be expelled now a pap smear is at least it used to be routinely performed now sometimes it's every five years but the recommendations change but a pap smear is um, a scraping of, or sampling of the cervical cells to check for uterine cancer because that's a common site for uterine cancer to form and extending from the body of the uterus we have the uterine tubes and we're going to look at the uterine tubes next they can also be called oviducts uterine horns and fallopian tubes they have a lot of names okay so the uterine tubes have a mucosa and I'm gonna look at the picture on the bottom first um, the mucosa consists of epithelial tissue here and you'll see it's highly convoluted meaning the lining yeah it's got an interesting surface area it's all convoluted so there's a lot of surface area it's highly folded and it's um, composed of simple columnar epithelium and that's what these cells on the top are showing you is the mucosa of the uterine tubes so the uterine tubes contain red these red cells and these green cells and those are the ones that secrete the fluid in addition uterine tubes um, also have cells in the mucosa that have cilia and so the cilia are important for moving the fluid made by the cells that were red and green in that picture and that helps move along both sperm but mainly um, oocyte towards a fertilized egg towards the uterus so superficial to that mucosal layer is a muscularis layer right here you can see it in the bottom picture and that's smooth muscle and there's both longitudinal and circular layers there and those smooth muscle um, layers will contract in waves monthly to expel the menses or the endometrium and then also during um, labor when a baby's born so the functions of the uterine tubes are to capture the ovum at ovulation so ovulation is the time point when an ovary releases an egg or an ovum and the uterine tubes bend and the fimbriae drape over the ovary now the cilia inside the uterine tubes and on the fimbriae start um, bending or moving and they're made up of microtubules so they move and that creates a current of peritoneal fluid towards the infundibulum and it propels um, the ovum or eggs towards the uterine body 
Now there's also smooth muscle as I showed you in the wall of the uterine tube and it contracts in a wave-like manner to also help propel the ovum towards the uterine body. Now it turns out that the uterine tubes are also the site where fertilization usually occurs. So I've mentioned this previously, but the sperm will enter the vagina, the cervical canal, the body of the uterus, and then travel along the uterine tubes to meet up with the ovum. So fertilization typically takes place in the uterine tubes somewhere between the infundibulum and maybe midway of the uterine tube. And the sperm travels from the vagina through the cervical canal through the body of the uterus and out the uterine tubes to meet up with the oocyte or ovum that has been released from the ovary. And the oocyte or the ovum has to um, kind of travel wherever the fluid is moving. And so the fimbriae and the cilia create wave-like fluid movements that propel the oocyte towards the sperm. Now sperm live for six days in the female reproductive tract and it really doesn't take them very long to get here. And then they need to sort of adhere and stick around. And so um, we talked about the male reproductive system already and there's some compounds that help the sperm kind of stay located near the mucosa. And um, they live for six days there but the oocyte, once it has been released from the ovary, it really only lives without being fertilized for like a day. So it's important that the sperm, or if, if pregnancy is desired or fertilization is desired, it's important for the sperm to be at this location when ovulation takes place. Now typically fertilization takes place here but the fertilized egg is going to travel because of the peristalsis of the smooth muscle and the fluid movement. The fertilized egg is going to move into the body of the uterus and implant in the endometrium. And sometimes movement of the fertilized egg doesn't happen. And so the embryo or the fertilized egg embeds in the wall of the uterine tube. This is referred to as an ectopic pregnancy. So this uh, ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs in the uterine tube, so sometimes it's called a tubal pregnancy. The fertilized egg, also known as a zygote, implants there and begins developing. But that tube will not expand to accommodate a developing fetus like the uterus can. The uterine tube doesn't stretch wide enough. And of course there's no nutrient, not the, the highly vascular and nutrient rich source of um, carbohydrates that are present in the uterus. And so the embryo usually is just naturally aborted. Sometimes referred to as a spontaneous abortion. Okay, now what we have left to look at are the um, primary organs of the female reproductive system. These are the ovaries, right and left. And there's different regions of the ovaries. So the outermost region, and this bracket kind of shows you the outermost region, is called the cortex. And then the innermost region is referred to as the medulla. We've seen those terms before. The medulla has larger blood vessels, you can see those here, and that would include the ovarian artery coming in as well as the ovarian vein sending blood outward. And of course they're, they're going to branch into smaller vessels that reach the cortex. I mean the whole ovary has a blood supply, um, but the medulla is quite rich in larger diameter blood vessels. The outer surface of the ovary is covered in a membrane that we've seen before called the tunica albiginia because we saw that that surrounds the testis 
and also forms the septa in between seminiferous tubules in the male testis. Now what the ovaries are known for is oogenesis and hormone production. So oogenesis is the production of an oocyte, also called an egg, also called an ovum. And what you might notice in this picture is one region containing an oocyte that's kind of surrounded by this fluid space. The blue is fluid. And then there's some other cells around it. Those are epithelial cells, and they make up what's called a follicle. So an oocyte, as it develops, is its own cell. And it's going to change. It's going to undergo meiosis um, to form. But there's also cells that surround it. And those develop as well from one layer to many layers. And they change shape. And those cells make up what's called a follicle. So oocytes develop inside what we call follicles. And this typically is taking place in the cortex region. And oogenesis is just part of what we've previously called gamete formation or gametogenesis. Gametogenesis. It's, it's oogenesis just is talking about making this oocyte from a germline cell, which is diploid, to a haploid cell or a gamete that has 23 chromosomes. So 23 chromosomes is the haploid number. That's part of gametogenesis. But the growth of the follicle that I showed you on the previous diagram is called folliculogenesis. So there's two parts to gametogenesis in the ovaries compared to in the testes. Those follicle cells make the sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Just like in the testicle, we saw that the developing spermatocyte and mature sperm, they don't, those aren't the cells that make the testosterone. The cells outside the germinal epithelium, those cells of Leydig, made testosterone. And that's the same here. We have a cell that's going to form an oocyte, and then we have cells outside of that, follicle cells, that are going to make the estrogen and the progesterone. Now the reason that the estrogen and progesterone are so important is because those hormones control the uterus. And there's a cycle of the uterus, happens approximately every month from beginning to end, and it's called the uterine menstrual cycle. It's all about preparing the uterus for a potential pregnancy or fertilization event. And what needs to happen in the uterus is that that endometrium needs to become thicker and um, develop more blood supply in preparation for a developing embryo. So the estrogen and progesterone control what happens in the uterus. The other thing, of course, that the ovaries need to do is expel the oocyte, release it, so that the oocyte can move into the uterine tubes and meet up with the sperm. So what you're seeing in this picture on the lower right is the surface of an ovary, kind of shown in white here. And there's um, a surgical instrument that's kind of pushing the surface of the ovary away from the site of ovulation and um, the oocyte or ovum, egg, whatever, is this clear cell with the arrow pointing to it. Then there's this structure called the spindle and that spindle contains the three polar bodies that form. So you might remember that when um, an oocyte is formed, 
it's going to undergo two meiotic divisions. And the first division produces one polar body and one egg. And then, which is really called a secondary oocyte, whatever, primary oocyte. And then the second division is going to be division of the polar body into two more and division of the primary oocyte into two cells, each containing 23 chromosomes. One of those will be a polar body, and one of those will be a secondary oocyte. But what's happening here at ovulation is release of a primary oocyte. So I'm drawing a number one with a degree sign to mean primary. That's a primary oocyte that's being released from the ovary. And the attached polar bodies will kind of be released with it. Okay, that is the end of this uh, first lecture on the female reproductive system. And we have three more for next week. But thank you for listening to this introduction.